Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Glad to begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray, pray for us. us. Saint James, pray, pray for us. Saint Bernadette, pray, pray for us. Saint Therese, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to those of you who are new for the first time. This is the third and final lecture of our Reasons to Believe series. <clears throat> In week one, we examined the arguments for and against the existence of God, and we decided to be theists. <laughs> in week two, we examined the arguments for and against the divinity of Christ, and we decided to be Christians. Now, we're going to examine the four marks of the church, that the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, and, spoiler alert, we're going to decide to be Catholics. Now, my own conversion to Catholicism was fairly intellectual, although um, I've learned a lot since then, and that's the great thing about theology, is you can never know it all. You can always learn more. Mm -hmm. So, having been raised as a Lutheran, my main objections to Catholicism had to do with what the Church teaches about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and what the Church teaches about the Eucharist. But wouldn't you know that it's just the way that God's providence works, that those things that started out as my main objections to the Catholic faith were actually the ways that God providentially ended up bringing me all the way home to the Catholic Church, namely through experiencing the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary in my own life, and through the ardent desire that I had to be substantially united to Jesus in the Eucharist. But rather than share the details of my conversion story with you tonight, I thought I would share the fruits of study that I've done even since then about um, the differing claims that Christians make on issues of authority and what it means to live a Christian life. I should say briefly that I will touch on issues regarding Orthodox Christianity somewhat, although for the sake of time, I mainly had to confine my discourse to the differences that separate Protestants and Catholics. We'll draw from sources including sacred scripture, the catechism of the Catholic Church, the writings of the earliest Christians, and also of contemporary theologians. One contemporary theologian I would like to introduce you to right off the bat is Frank Sheed. Frank Sheed was an Australian-born lawyer who later moved to England and married a woman named Maisie Ward. He took up a defense of the Catholic faith through a street evangelization organization called the Catholic Evidence Guild, and along with his wife Maisie, they founded a Catholic publishing company called Sheed and Ward that had publishing houses both in London and in New York City. Sheed was a prolific writer and is hailed as one of the finest lay theologians of the 20th century. Here's what Frank Sheed had to say about the four marks of the church. When we say the Nicene Creed, we call the church one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Rightly, we speak of these as her four marks. Pause upon these marks. They mean outward showings, visible to anyone who troubles to look. They do not require the eye of faith. Any rational observer can see that they are there. He may not see the importance the Catholic sees in them, but once he knows what we mean by the marks, the qualities outwardly shown, he will admit that the Church does actually show them. For the Catholic, they are immeasurably more than that. They are the outward showings of inner realities. The showing can vary from age to age, according as men respond well or ill to the gifts from above. But the inner reality abides changeless. Christ made his church thus. It can never be otherwise. So we'll take these four marks of the church in reverse order. First, we'll consider apostolicity, particularly the question of who or what has the authority to determine Christian faith and practice. Second, we'll examine the relationship of small c Catholic to big c Catholic and explain what it means for the church to be universal. Third, we'll talk about sanctity or holiness of the church and why the church is holy and how God wants to help us become holy too. 
Fourthly, we'll see how desperately Jesus desires unity among his followers, and we'll ask for the grace to work and to pray for the unity of all Christians. Lastly, as always, I'll offer you some resources for further study. So, the first and most important question we have to tackle is the question of authority. Who or what has the authority to speak definitively on matters of Christian faith and practice? This disputed question of authority is unfortunately the central cause of division among Christians. More than anything else, it's this question of authority that separates Protestant and Catholic and Orthodox Christians from one another. <laughs> As we'll see at the end of this presentation, this separation among Christians is truly a wound in the body of Christ, one that Jesus desires so ardently to be healed so that Christians can be one as he and the Father are one. So if we're going to treat this wound, we have to look first at what inflicted it, which is this disagreement on the issue of authority. Before we dive into the disagreement between Protestants and Catholics on this issue of authority, it's important to take a moment to highlight some of the things that we all agree upon. We, Catholics and Protestants, both agree that God exists. We both agree that Jesus is God. We both agree that Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried, that he rose from the dead on the third day. We both agree that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was an infinitely meritorious gift by which our sins are cleansed and by which we are offered the opportunity to be restored to friendship with God both in this life and in the next. We both agree that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the <coughs> disciples, and then after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. And all of us who are baptized, whether Catholic or Protestant, are united together in one Christian family, although that union is imperfect, again because of the wounds that afflict the body of Christ. So as you can see, as Catholics and as Protestants, we agree on a lot. And it's always good to remind ourselves first, anytime you're debating anything with anybody, Agree wherever you can, and build that common ground, build that goodwill so that you can, you can set aside your agreements and narrow in just on the few places where you might disagree. So having reminded ourselves of where we agree, we now have to turn to the disagreement. The question is this, having ascended to the right hand of the Father, Jesus reigns eternally from heaven. But who or what did he leave on earth to guide his pilgrim people, that's us, toward our heavenly homeland? For Protestants, the answer is a what. What Jesus left is the Bible, the sacred scripture. And for Protestants, the Bible is the sole source of authority for Christian faith and practice. This view is known as sola scriptura, Latin for scripture alone. And questions of Christian doctrine and morals on the Protestant view are to be decided by scripture alone. For Catholics, the answer is a what and a who. We Catholics agree that the Bible is the Word of God, but on the Catholic view, the Bible does not exhaust the Word of God. And we believe that God's Word is revealed not only through sacred scripture, but also through sacred tradition, handed down in the preaching and teaching of the apostles. Furthermore, Catholics believe that these twin sources of revelation, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, are interpreted authoritatively by the successors of the apostles, namely the Pope and the bishops in union with the Pope through the teaching office that they exercise, which is called the magisterium. That's a big fancy Latin word that just comes from the word magister, which means teacher. So remember, our question was, who or what did Jesus leave on earth to guide successive generations of his followers on our pilgrim journey to heaven? On the Protestant view, the answer is just scripture, scripture alone. On the Catholic view, the answer is sacred scripture and also sacred tradition interpreted authoritatively by the magisterium. So we have these two competing views, and now we have to ask the question, who's right? Well, as you might have guessed from the fact that yours truly converted from <laughs> Protestantism to Catholicism, I would submit to you that the Catholic Church is right on this question of authority. And to explain why, I want to show you that sola scriptura is an unbiblical doctrine, one that disproves itself and then show you that the disagreement that results among Protestants uh, is because of this impoverished view that they have of authority. Finally, I'll explain the benefits that the Catholic Church has precisely because it is apostolic, because it has inherited sacred tradition, and it has the authority 
to interpret sacred scripture and sacred tradition through the magisterium. So first, here are four reasons why Sola Scriptura isn't true, and by extension, why Protestant doctrines that are derived from Sola Scriptura also aren't true. Many of these ideas I have gleaned from Trent Horn's book, The Case for Catholicism, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation, and also a presentation he gave to a Protestant audience called My Doubts About Sola Scriptura. So here we go. Number one, what do we mean by Sola Scriptura? Is it sufficient for a doctrine merely not to contradict Scripture? Or does it need to be explicitly spelled out in Scripture in order to be believed? Because a Catholic could agree with Sola Scriptura as far as that first meaning goes. We Catholics don't believe anything that contradicts Scripture, even though, not, even though some of what we believe isn't explicitly spelled out in Scripture. But it seems that when Protestants say Sola Scriptura, they're adopting the second, stricter view. For example, Protestant apologists Norm Geisler and Ralph McKenzie take the position that, quote, the Bible, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else, is all that is necessary for faith and practice. But even Protestants believe things that aren't explicitly laid out in Scripture. For example, the word Trinity isn't found anywhere in the Bible, and Trinitarian theology took centuries after the time of Christ to be developed, but that doesn't stop Protestants from rightly believing in the triune God. It's just that that's an area where most Protestants still agree with the theologians and the councils of the, of the first few centuries of Christianity, even though they don't hesitate to decry those same theologians and those same councils from the early centuries as regards doctrines which Protestantism later evolved to disagree with. Our second point, where does the Bible teach Sola Scriptura? It doesn't. It doesn't. Sola Scriptura is immediately falsifiable because the doctrine itself cannot be found in the Bible. Now, one proof text that uh, Protestants often turn to for this is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, which says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may, may be proficient equipped for every good work. And as a Catholic, I would say, Amen, brother! <laughs> right? We absolutely agree that Scripture is inspired by God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 doesn't say that only Scripture is inspired by, by God. And so Protestants read too much into this, into this verse and others like it. As Catholic apologist Jimmy Aiken, also a convert from Protestantism to Catholicism, notes in a book that he wrote on the Bible, Sola Scriptura is plagued with problems. If every doctrine must be proved by scripture alone, then sola scriptura must be proved this way, and it can't be. Nobody dreamed of using this principle in the apostolic age, when the apostles were authoritatively preaching the Christian message in the form of oral tradition. Instead, the apostles ordered their followers to hold fast to both written and unwritten traditions, as St. Paul says in his letter to the Thessalonians, hold fast to what I've handed on to you either by word of mouth or by letter. And the apostles are commended for doing so. And there's no passage anywhere in the rest of scripture that says this was to change after the time of the apostles. There's nowhere in scripture that it says, well, for right now I'm going to give the apostles my authority, but then I'm going to take it away and you're just left with this book. No. It, everything in scripture says that written and unwritten authority are both to continue through the church of Christ until the end of time. And so, as, as I added the emphasis here, as a doctrine, Sola Scriptura is self-defeating. It fails its own test. I wish somebody would have told me that when I was a Protestant. I would have become a Catholic so much faster. <laughs> so would you, let's, let's just, please repeat after me. As a doctrine, as a doctrine, doctrine Sola Scriptura is self-defeating. Sola Scriptura is self-defeating. It fails its own test. It fails its own test. Okay, glory to Jesus Christ. Now, our third question, what is scripture? As we know, the Bible is a collection of books, but the concept of sola scriptura assumes that there is an agreed upon document called scripture whose contents we all agree about. Now, most Protestants don't stop to consider the fact that none of the books of the Bible list what other books are supposed to be in the Bible. The exact contents of the Bible, that is to say, which books belong in the Bible and which books don't, or what's known as the canon of scripture, that is itself a product of sacred tradition. 
It's not something inherent to Scripture itself. The table of contents page at the front of your Bible is not divinely inspired. The bishops who settled what the canon of Scripture is were. Regarding the canon of Scripture, Jimmy Aiken writes, Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Catholic Church discerned which books, 73 books in total, belonged in the Bible. And in 382, Pope Damasus I established the canon of Scripture. This was reaffirmed by various local councils and popes and by the Ecumenical Council of Florence in 1442. When the Protestant Reformation began, the reformers attempted to decanonize certain books of Scripture, resulting in the 66 book canon that modern Protestant Bibles have. But the Council of Trent infallibly reaffirmed the 73 book canon in 1546. Because the reformers advocated ideas contradicting tradition and the magisterium, they rejected their authority <coughs> and abandoned the principles Christians had used since the apostolic age, leaving them free to interpret scripture however they desired. They advocated the novel principle that doctrine should be established sola scriptura, or by scripture alone. This uncertainty about the canon itself is itself a death blow to sola scriptura. After all, Imagine that you're a Protestant. If Sola Scriptura is your only authority, you would better be darn sure that you have all the books that are supposed to be Scripture and none of the books that aren't. But, as we said, the list of books that belong in the Bible is not a self-authenticating list. And apart from sacred tradition, the best you can get is what the late Protestant theologian R.C. Sproul says, that, script, that the Bible is a fallible, collect, a fallible collection of infallible books. But what good is an infallible book without a, an infallible interpreter? And so the Reformed theologian Douglas Wilson offers this sober analysis. The problem with contemporary Protestants is that they have no doctrine of the table of contents. With the approach that is popular in conservative evangelical circles, one simply comes to the Bible by means of an epistemological lurch. The Bible just is, and any questions about how it got there are dismissed as a nuisance. But time passes, the questions remain unanswered, the silence becomes awkward, and the conversions of thoughtful evangelicals to Rome proceed apace. <laughs> Fourthly, is scripture sufficiently clear on its own? One corollary of sola scriptura is the belief that scripture is sufficiently clear on major issues at least, such that no, no outside authority is needed. In other words, that each individual believer can arrive at the correct conclusions, at least about major issues, on his or her own. Some Protestants put it this way. They say, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. Even Martin Luther went so far as to say that, quote, they who deny the all clearness and all plainness of the scriptures leave us nothing but darkness. End quote. But scripture itself teaches that, for example, some of the letters of St. Paul are hard to understand by which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. And furthermore, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. The innumerable disagreements among Protestants about main things are a sign that Luther and everyone else who teaches the perspicuity of scripture as the doctrine is called, are wrong. After all, Protestants disagree about all kinds of issues of tremendous importance to our salvation. For example, like basic question, is baptism necessary for salvation? A Lutheran would say yes. A Baptist would say no. Both of them can cherry pick Bible verses as proof text for their position, but <coughs> baptism either is necessary or isn't necessary for salvation. And so regardless of which one is true, one or the other of these major Protestant denominations is severely misguided. Another question, can you lose your salvation? An Arminian, like a Methodist, would say yes, you can lose your salvation. A Calvinist, like a Presbyterian, would say no. It's really important to know whether our sinfulness affects whether we can lose our salvation and what that means about God and what that means about us. And it's either the case that we can lose our salvation or that we can't lose our salvation. It's either the case that we can gain and lose and gain and lose our salvation by sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting, or it's the case that once we're saved, we're always saved. But regardless of which one is true, a good chunk of Protestants disagree with their fellow Protestants, 
about a supposedly clear and eternally important issue. I'll give you one last example from Scripture itself. Consider in Acts chapter 8, where the evangelist Philip comes across a eunuch reading the book of Isaiah. Philip says to the eunuch, Do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch replies, How can I, unless someone guides me? Given that Protestants hold mutually contradicting views, even among themselves, on issues of salvific importance, it's clear that at least some of them don't understand what they are reading either. Luckily, Jesus desires his children to have a sure foundation, sure foundation for their understanding of these issues, which is why he gave the church a living teaching office in the magisterium, the successors of the apostles down to the present day. This is precisely the infallible interpreter that we need if we are to understand sacred scripture and sacred tradition correctly. As St. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So having shown that sola scriptura is a self-defeating, unbiblical, man-made doctrine that contradicts what God intends for the fullness of truth in his church, we turn now to what exactly it means to say that the church is apostolic. Frank Sheed says this, As a mark, apostolicity is seen in a variety of ways, notably three. First, the church goes back in an unbroken line to the one that came to life in our world on the first Pentecost. By the laying on of hands, every bishop, every priest, is linked with the apostles. Second, the church, like the apostles, teaches and has always taught whatever Christ taught. At no point has it ever been conceived, for example, that with the progress of learning, we know better than he. There has been development, but always a genuine development of what he gave. Third, the church teaches as the apostles taught, that is, with complete authority. At every age, she has said what the apostles said at the Council of Jerusalem. It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. As we wrap up this section on the apostolicity of the church, I want to address one objection that I often hear to the notion of apostolic succession. Some people claim that Jesus may well have given his authority to the apostles. After all, Scripture is shot through with Jesus constantly saying things like, whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever receives you, receives me. Okay? But people claim, some people, that this authority died out when those men died. However, this view is entirely contrary to the biblical evidence. One instance I would point to of this notion of apostolic succession continuing on is found in Acts chapter 1, when the remaining apostles are looking to replace Judas by casting lots to decide between Barsabbas and Matthias. In his speech to the rest of the apostles, St. Peter quotes a psalm that says, let another man take his position of overseer. Now the, this word overseer, the Greek word is episkopos, and it's even clearer in the King James translation of the Bible, which says, let another man his bishopric take. So we see that the office of bishop succeeds from person to person, even in Acts chapter one. Pope Clement says as much in his letter to the Corinthians from around the end of the first century. He says, Through countryside and city the apostles preached, and they appointed their earliest converts, testing them by the Spirit, to be the bishops and deacons of future believers. Nor was this a novelty, for bishops and deacons had been written about a long time earlier. Now keep in mind, Clement is writing in somewhere between 70 and 100 AD, the end of the first century. And he's already saying, a long time earlier, only maybe 50 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Our apostles knew, through our Lord Jesus Christ, that there would be strife for the office of bishop. For this reason, therefore, having received perfect foreknowledge, they appointed those who have already been mentioned, and afterwards added further provision that if they should die, other men should succeed to their ministry. Okay. The apostles were the first bishops of the church, and their authority has been passed down from one bishop to another all the way to the present. This authority that Jesus vests in the bishops is not only important for the doctrinal stability of the church, but also for her sacramental life, 
it's to the same apostles and their successors that Jesus gave the authority to forgive sins in the sacrament of confession. It's to the same apostles and their successors that Jesus gave the power to turn bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. He didn't give, he didn't give that authority to just anyone, but only to men who received the laying on of hands and the invocation of the Holy Spirit, as we see all throughout the book of Acts, and at every ordination of a priest or a bishop in the Catholic Church down to our present day. The next mark of the Church that we'll address is that the Church is Catholic. The word Catholic comes from two Greek words, kataholos, which mean according to the whole, or universal. Now, at this point, some Protestants will remark that the word Catholic in the Nicene Creed, spelled with a small c, refers to some kind of invisible collection of all believers, rather than the visible church. Now, it's true that Catholic with a big C is um, a noun in the sense that we usually mean the Catholic Church, big C Catholic. Catholic with a small c means universal in an, in an adjective sense, okay? But it's also true that when the Nicene Creed was written, there were no other churches. There was no such thing as Protestantism in the first centuries of Christianity. There was heresy, people who held false beliefs about God and Jesus, and then there was the Catholic Church. Those were your only two options. So when the church is called Catholic in the Nicene Creed, the one church it's referring to is the Catholic Church that subsists Bixie Catholic today in the proper noun sense, the Catholic Church. Now, going back to this question of the visible versus invisible church, it's true, we have to give our, our Protestant friends some credit, it's true that there is an, an invisible element to the church. After all, the saints and the angels and the souls in purgatory are all members of the same church, the same church that we are, even though invisibly. But the church that Jesus Christ founded is not merely an invisible collection of everyone who believes in Jesus. It is a visible reality such that you can know whether or not you're in it. And those who argue that the church is not a visible reality have neither scripture nor history on their side. Scripturally speaking, we can turn to Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus addresses how Christians should handle disputes among themselves. Jesus says, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, <coughs> let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So you see, Jesus is presupposing here that there is a person or a group of people, like a bishop or a group of bishops, who represent the church in a visible fashion and to speak with her authority. But we see from the history of Protestantism that Protestantism is just one disagreement after another, with none of this authority structure that Jesus envisions anywhere in sight. Think about it. Martin Luther disagreed with the Catholic Church, so he just went off and founded Lutheranism. Some guy at your local First Baptist Church disagrees with what his pastor says about the Bible, so he goes off and founds Second Baptist Church, and so on. I just can't stress to you enough how much this notion of having all kinds of splinter groups, this notion of just founding a new church when you run across some teaching you don't like, is entirely unbiblical. There's no biblical precedent for this whatsoever. And it's only because our Protestant brothers and sisters lack the interpretive security of an authoritative magisterium that so much division has ensued in the history of Christianity. The witness of the early Christians also demonstrates the visible nature of the church. We find, for example, the earliest use of the word Catholic in the letter of St. Ignatius of Antioch to the Christians at Smyrna from around the year 110. He writes, Let no one do anything of concern to the church without the bishop, let that be considered a valid Eucharist, which is celebrated by the bishop, or by one whom he ordains, which is to say, a priest. Wherever the bishop appears, there let the people be. Just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. 
Since the time that Jesus established his church on St. Peter and his successors, to which I would point you to Matthew 16, verses 18, 18 through 19, it has spread over the whole earth and throughout all of the 2000, nearly 2,000 years since that time. Frank Sheed summarizes this by saying, two points may be worth noting about the mark of Catholicity. Every sort of nation has joined the church, each feeling wholly at home, and every sort of man in every nation has joined it, lived in it, and loved it. There is no such thing as a Catholic type. There are vast differences between centuries and civilizations and nations and individuals. But the church is able to get down below the differences to that in humanity which all men have, for she is made by the God who made men. Next, let's talk about holiness. Some people object to the Catholic Church because of the sins of her members. I myself came into the church during the fall of 2017, just before the so-called summer of scandal and the McCarrick Report and all that. People around me were wondering why I became a Catholic, or wondering why they should stay a Catholic, given that such inexcusable crimes were committed even at the highest levels of the church. My response was always that I didn't become Catholic because Catholics are perfect. I became Catholic because everything that Catholicism teaches is true. And I wanted to hold as many true beliefs and as few false beliefs as possible. Besides, even if everyone in the Catholic Church were to be perfect, that would no longer be the case once I joined. Okay? I'm a sinner. And what's more, I don't think it's fair to judge the whole church by the actions of people who refuse to obey her teachings. That would be like judging the efficacy of a medication based on the effect it has on people who don't take it. Instead, we should judge the church based on the people that she holds up as exemplars of her own teaching, the people who take the medicine of holiness, that is to say, the saints. Furthermore, the church is always full of saints and sinners, but her holiness is not measured by the ratio between one and the other. Instead, her holiness is that of Christ himself, who continues to animate his church so as to give graces to saints and sinners alike. As Frank Sheed notes, in this profounder sense, the holiness of the church is simply the holiness of Christ. It is his church, made by him as the bearer of holiness to men. Every member in contact with him has available to him a fount of holiness. There is no limit, save our own will, to receive what he has to give. For the church, there is no growth, and of course, no diminishing. If every one of her members were in a state of grace at a given moment, the church's holiness would be no greater. If we were all in mortal sin together, it would be no less. In other words, the holiness of the church is not the sum total of the holiness of all her members, any more than the wetness of rain is measured by the wetness of all those who have ventured out in it. If the whole population goes out and gets, and gets drenched, the rain is no wetter. If everyone stays indoors, the rain is no less wet. Rain is wet because it is rain, whether or not men expose themselves to it. The church is holy because it is Christ living on in the world. It is the cause of holiness to its members, but it is not measured by their response. In other words, it is by the saints and not by the mediocre still less by the great sinners, that the church is to be judged. A medicine must not be judged by those who buy it, but by those who actually take it. A church must not be judged, excuse me, a church must be judged by those who hear and obey, not by those who half hear and disobey when obedience is difficult. The saints in their thousands upon thousands stand as proof that in the church, holiness is to be had if we will Every saint is certain evidence that if you and I are not saints, the choice is wholly our own. So you might be wondering at this point, well, how does God give grace to souls? How am I made to be holy? The ordinary means by which God gives us grace is through the sacraments. So let's answer a few preliminary questions about this. What is grace? Grace is God's free gift of his own divine life operative in our souls. Why do we need grace? 
Because we want to live and to love as God does, we want to lead lives of supernatural virtue so that we can experience true human flourishing, both in this life and in the next life, that we can eventually, please God, spend eternity with him in heaven. Sheed writes, For heaven, our natural life, apart from grace, is not sufficient. We need supernatural life. We can have it only by God's free gift, which is why we call it grace. The word is related to gratis. Sanctifying grace will be our next topic. Everything the church does is connected with it. When we come to die, there is only one question that matters. Have we sanctifying grace in our souls? If we have, then to heaven we shall go. There may be certain matters to be cleared or cleansed on the way, but to heaven we shall go, for we have the power to live there. If we have not the sanctifying grace in our souls, then to heaven we cannot go, because not because we lack the price of admission, but because quite simply our soul lacks the powers that living in heaven calls for. So if we want to live the life of heaven, both in time and in eternity, we're going to need God to give us sanctifying grace. And the ordinary means by which God does this is through the sacraments of the church. So what is a sacrament? According to the glossary of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, a sacrament is an efficacious sign of grace, a sign that accomplishes what it signifies, instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church, by which divine life is dispensed to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. The sacraments are seven in number, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, penance or reconciliation, pardon the typo, anointing of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony. All seven sacraments were instituted by Christ as the ordinary means by which God gives grace to souls. Now that doesn't mean that they're the only way that God can give grace to souls. After all, God is all-powerful, and God can give any graces he wants to anyone, at any time, and any way. But he gives us the sacraments for our own sake, so that we, who are not all-knowing, who are not all-powerful, can be assured that by receiving the sacraments worthily and fruitfully, we know that we are really receiving God's grace, that we are really receiving a share in God's own divine life. These same seven sacraments of the Catholic Church are shared by the Orthodox churches, since the Orthodox have maintained apostolic succession, and therefore they can confect all seven sacraments validly. Our Protestant brothers and sisters lack most of these sacraments, both because they themselves would deny that um, any or all of these things are necessary for leading a Christian life, and also because the Protestant communions have failed to maintain the apostolic lineage, and therefore they can't confect sacraments like the Eucharist or the anointing of the sick or anything like that. Anyway, there are two Protestant sacraments that are valid. The first one is baptism. Protestant baptisms are valid because anyone can baptize anybody validly as long as they do so using water and the Trinitarian formula and it, that they intend what the church does when she baptizes. So I, I should maybe digress here for a second. Um, uh, for, a val for a baptism to be, to be valid, the person has to be baptized with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and the person doing the baptizing has to intend what the church does. Um, they don't even have to know what that is, they just have to intend it. So for example, if two atheists were in a car accident, and one atheist turned to the other as they're bleeding out on the road, and, and they say, and he says to his friend, please baptize me, I actually want to be a Christian. The other atheist could take a, a bottle of water and pour it on the other guy's head and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that would be a valid baptism. Okay? You don't have to be a priest or a deacon or whatever to baptize, um, at least not in, not in extraordinary circumstances. Under ordinary, ordinary circumstances, priests and deacons and bishops are the ordinary ministers of the sacrament. But in extraordinary circumstances, anybody can baptize. <laughs> I should also point out that Mormon baptisms are not valid, even though they are done with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The reason they're not valid is because Mormons aren't monotheists. Mormons are henotheists, which I won't get into, but basically they don't believe what we believe about the nature of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so even though they use the right words and they use the right stuff, water, 
um, because they don't intend what the church intends, which is baptism into the one God, uh, Mormon baptisms aren't valid. One other digression I should make while I'm digressing on baptism is that, um, <laughs> that you can't be re-baptized. It's not possible. Um, being baptized is like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're either baptized or you're not. There's no such thing as being re-baptized. If you need to be re-baptized, you really weren't baptized in the first place. Okay, and if you are baptized validly, like we just said, there's no, there's nothing happens if you get re-baptized. They're just pouring water on you and nothing happens. Okay, so you're either baptized or you're not baptized, and um, you can't get re-baptized. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so anyway, where was I? The other Protestant sacrament that's valid is uh, Protestant marriages are valid. They are valid sacramental marriages because as long as the bride and groom are validly baptized, then they're Christians, and Jesus has raised the dignity of marriage to that of a sacrament. So, for example, when he says, what therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So, Protestant marriages are valid uh, because they are baptized, and so they have valid sacramental marriages. But other than baptism and marriage, um, Protestants don't have valid sacraments because they have broken that succession from the apostles. So, speaking, lastly, of things that God has joined together, but that man has unfortunately put asunder, let's talk about the unity of the church. Jesus' plea for Christian unity shines through most clearly in John chapter 17. It's the longest recorded prayer that we have from Jesus, called his high priestly prayer, and it takes place on the night of the Last Supper. I'm going to read it to you. St. John writes, After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, the words you gave to me, I have given them. And they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, that's Judas, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word. That's all of us. We believe in him through the word of the apostles. That they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The division among Christianity causes scandal to people who look to unity as a mark of the truth of the Christian faith. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Commenting on this high priestly prayer of Jesus, Frank Sheed notes that the importance of unity in our Lord's sight comes out unmistakably in the phrases he uses at the Last Supper, that, that they may be one as the Father and I are one. Right? 
Unity meant so much to him that upon it he was prepared to stake the proof of his own divinity, and it meant so much in itself that he could compare it to the unity within the Godhead of the first person and the second. Look at the words again. The unity was to be of men in the Trinity, that they may be one in us. That is the inner reality. But it must be outwardly visible that the world might see it as evidence of the inner reality of Christ. That is the mark. So given what we've seen already, we can say, can we say that all Christians are unified? Well, obviously not. We've seen the disagreements among and between our Protestant and Orthodox brothers and sisters. Regrettably, even among Catholics, we see so-called cafeteria Catholics who refuse to hold to the fullness, the organic unity of the faith taught by the Catholic Church. This division among Christians is not something to be celebrated. This division among Christians breaks Jesus' heart. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to guide us into the fullness of truth. That's John chapter 16, verse 13. And, the one, and one indicator of that fullness is the unity that God wants his children to have, just as the father of a family wants peace and concord and unity to reign in his home. In its decree on ecumenism, the Second Vatican Council explains that the separated Orthodox churches and Protestant communities as such, though we believe them to be deficient in some respects, have been by no means deprived of significance and importance in the mystery of salvation. For the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as means of salvation which derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, our separated brethren, whether considered as individuals or as communities and churches, are not blessed with that unity which Jesus Christ wished to bestow on all those who through him were born again into one body and with him quickened to newness of life. That unity which the Holy Scriptures and the ancient tradition of the Church proclaim. For it is only through Christ's Catholic Church, which is the all-embracing means of salvation, that they can benefit fully from the means of salvation. We believe that our Lord entrusted all the blessings of the New Covenant to the Apostolic College alone, of which Peter is the head, in order to establish the one body of Christ on earth, to which all should be fully incorporated who belong in any way to the people of God. This people of God, though still in its members liable to sin, is ever growing in Christ during its pilgrimage on earth, and is guided by God's gentle wisdom according to his hidden designs, until it shall happily arrive at the fullness of eternal glory in the heavenly Jerusalem. So which group of Christians can be said to enjoy the fullness of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church? Which church has all the gifts that Jesus wanted to entrust to his children. It's certainly not our Protestant brothers and sisters, because their basic doctrinal commitment of sola scriptura is a self-defeating proposition, and one that results in their inability even to agree among themselves. Forget about agreeing with the Catholic Church. They can't even agree among themselves on major issues of salvific importance. What's more, the Protestant communities lack most or all of the sacraments that Jesus intended as the ordinary means by which God gives grace to souls. It also can't be our Orthodox brothers and sisters either, because even though they do have valid apostolic succession, and therefore they do have all seven valid sacraments, they lack that unity that Jesus desires for his church because they have a nationalistic focus oftentimes, and more so because they reject the primacy of the popes, the successors of St. Peter as the head of the Apostolic College and the sign, the visible sign of unity in the Church. Instead, as the Second Vatican Council says in its dogmatic constitution on the Church, this is the one Church of Christ in which the Creed is professed as one holy Catholic and apostolic, which our Savior, after his resurrection, commissioned Peter to shepherd, and him and the other apostles to extend and direct with authority, which he erected for all ages as the pillar and mainstay of truth. This church, constituted and organized in the world as a society, subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. Although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure, these elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, 
are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. Jesus earnestly desires to unite all Christians in the church that he founded. He says as much in John chapter 10, verse 16, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so that there will be one flock, one shepherd. May we, by God's grace, show by our words and by our actions that we are worthy of the name of Christian, and may we work and pray for the unity of all Christians in that one flock with one shepherd. So now I will commend to you some further resources. One book that I give away to everybody I know, and I have extra copies if you want one, talk to me afterwards, is Why We're Catholic by Trent Horn. Trent Horn wrote this book at like an eighth grade reading level so that you can give it to anybody. And it builds up from why do we believe that anything is objectively true? Why do we believe truth about science? Why do we believe truth about reality? And it builds from just a foundation of there must be true things in the world. It builds from that foundation to why do we believe that God exists? Why do we believe Jesus is God? Why do we have the Bible and the Mass and the Eucharist and the sacraments and all the way up to heaven, hell, purgatory, and just all kinds of different issues. So you can give this to someone, whether they're an atheist, whether they're an agnostic, a Muslim, a Jew, a Buddhist, a Protestant, a fallen away Catholic, whatever. This is the book for them. And like I say, I will give everyone in this room a copy um, if you don't have one already. The second book I would like to recommend is Rome Sweet Home by Dr. Scott Hahn. I read this book shortly around the time of my conversion. I can't remember before or after, but um, Scott Hahn is, is uh, worthily very well known for um, his conversion to, to the Catholic faith and the work that he has done to bring probably hundreds of thousands or millions of fellow Christians into the Catholic Church. If there's a thank you line in heaven, I think Scott Hans is going to be one of the longest. The next book I will recommend is the one by Frank Sheed that I have been quoting from called Theology for Beginners. Um, Frank Sheed actually wrote three books that kind of successively deal with the same set of material in more depth. The surface level one is called A Map of Life, A Map of Life, and it's a walk just through the creed. This is the middle level one. It's also very accessible, Theology for Beginners. And then the more uh, scholarly one that he wrote is called Theology and Sanity. They're all very good. Anybody who just read those three books would have a really solid grounding in everything that we believe as Catholics. Um, even priests, I know priests who read those just to kind of review. You know, it's been a long time since seminary or whatever. Those are a good place to go. The next book is a, a brand new one. This one just came out uh, a few months ago. It's called The Early Church Was the Catholic Church by Joe Heschmeyer. If you want to know what the earliest Christians believed, this is the book for you. When I was a Protestant, I thought that we just couldn't know what the earliest Christians thought. In my mind, there was just a gap between the end of the apostolic age, you know, the end of the first century, and then 1517, it was like nothing happened, you know. But it was actually in church history class in high school, as a Protestant, when I started studying church history, what happened in the intervening 1,500 years of Christian, you know, 75% of Christian history, I realized, wait a minute, we can actually know what these people taught and thought and said, and so it was, that was actually the seed of my conversion, was I wanted to believe what the earliest Christians believed, the people who were closest in time and language and culture to Jesus, who had the best chance of understanding Jesus, right? That was, that was them, right? First century, second century, and when you go back and read the huge volume of excellent writings that we have from the earliest Christians, you find they're not Protestant, <laughs> okay? <laughs> they're, they're Catholic. Um, uh, if you want a scholarly defense of all of this, The Case for Catholicism by Trent Horn. This is pretty heady stuff, but he very expertly um, ties in Protestant scholarship um, and rebuts, as it says, classic and contemporary Protestant objections. There are very few one-volume um, treatments of Catholicism versus Protestantism on the market, uh, and that's why Trent wrote this one, and it's very, very good, so I recommend it. The book that um, kind of started this apologetics renaissance in the past few decades, uh, I would say in the 1980s, was this one, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, 
The Attack on Romanism by Bible Christians by Carl Keating. Carl Keating is the founder of Catholic Answers, the apostle that I mentioned at every one of these presentations that you should definitely read everything they ever write. Um, he wrote this, this book developed out of a series of like pamphlets that he wrote because one time he walked out of mass and the local like fundamentalist church had uh, gone around to all the cars and put little tracts on people's church about why Catholicism isn't true and all that. And Carl Keating was really upset by that um, because he knew that what those fundamentalist Protestants were saying also wasn't true. So he wrote up a little pamphlet of his own, and he went to their church, and he put it on all their church. <laughs> okay? And then people saw it, and, and, and so he made up this thing called Catholic Answers. It was just a totally shell company, okay? But he bought like a P.O. box, and people started writing him and saying, please send us everything that Catholic Answers publishes. And he sent them a reply saying, uh, it's all out of print. And the reason was he didn't write anything else. That was <laughs> he hadn't written anything yet. So he wrote, he wrote this book, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, as the, the book-length version of those tracts that he was writing. And of course now Catholic Answers has an entire publishing house where they publish all kinds of very excellent books. One of my favorite books, the kind of book that I would reread every year if I didn't have a lot of other books to read, is The Light of Christ, An Introduction to Catholicism by Father Thomas Joseph White, a Dominican. I would say, um, if you're going to buy one book off this list, I'm giving you buy this book. He treats everything from creation and what do we believe about Adam and Eve and all that kind of stuff and what's the Trinity and okay, he goes all the way down through like the sacraments and the four last things and it's all here in very clear but very thorough language. Uh, lastly, I'm going to give you a few recommendations on on biblical theology in particular. If you have a Protestant friend and you want to talk to them about this, uh, here's 100 Biblical Arguments Against Sola Scriptura. It's a very short book, um, but he just, he just goes through you know, short arguments from Scripture that show that Scripture doesn't teach, that Scripture alone is the sole source of faith and practice for Christians. <clears throat> if you want the scholarly treatment about the difference between the, the 66 book Protestant Bible and the original 73 book, Everyone's Bible, um, that's this book, it's called Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're looking for a, a really, if you're looking for a very approachable introduction to, um, to the Bible, you should read The Bible is a Catholic Book by Jimmy Aiken. This is another one that's written at like an eighth grade reading level. You can actually read this with eighth graders, or you can give this to people who are not really sure why do Christians believe the Bible or biblical history and archaeology. It goes on to all that kind of stuff. So um, highly recommended. A couple podcasts that I will recommend to you. The Council, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, the Council of Trent is by Trent Horn. It was very providential that he was named Trent, so he could make that pun. <laughs> um, and then The Cordial Catholic is by, uh, I think he's a Canadian, named Keith Albert Little, um, also a convert to Catholicism from evangelicalism. He has a lot of great uh, people on, he interviews a lot of great people on his podcast, and this particular podcast is a favorite of those of us on the staff here at the parish. And lastly, as always, I recommend the Catholic Angels website. I call it Catholic Google. Anytime you have a question about Catholicism, you go to catholic.com, catholic.com, you just type in your question there, and you get primo, orthodox, easy to understand um, answers to your questions, right like that, okay? So with that, I want to thank you for joining me for this series, and I want to conclude with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, grace, the Lord, Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. St. James, pray for us. St. Bernadette, pray for us. St. Therese, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Mary. Can I make one um, observation or point? Um, I started attending the um, 
Eastern Rite Catholic Church when I was 14 and all the craziness yes. about it. Yes. Do, and you never knew what you were going to get right. when you went to church <laughs> in a Latin Rite Church. And, um, and Jim and I were married at St. Michael's Ukrainian Catholic Church in Mishawaka. His grandmother was from Poland and she kept shaking her head, not a Catholic church, not a Catholic church, saying it in Polish, you know. But this is so true that uh, Latin Rite Catholics in this country do not know about the Eastern it's true. rites. And they think that they are all Orthodox. Yeah, let, let me, let me, for those of you who don't know what she's talking about, let me give you the, let me give you the quick catechesis. Um, so sometimes we're, we're called Roman Catholics, that's a that's a, a pejorative term that Protestants made up to make us sound bad. They say we're Roman, okay? Um, actually, we're all Catholic, and the Catholic Church is not the same set as the Roman Church. About 98% of Catholics in the world are Roman Catholic, the Latin rite, the Western rite of Catholicism. But there are, uh, I think, 23 other churches that are Catholic churches, even though they're not Roman Catholic churches, they're not Latin Catholic churches. All of these, the Latin church and the, uh, they're called sui iuris churches, the Eastern churches, they're all Catholic. They all have the Pope as the head, okay? So they're fully Catholic, they're not Orthodox. But they don't have the Roman or Latin um, liturgical patrimony, they don't have Roman or Latin like devotion, they don't pray the rosary necessarily, you know? Um, so it's entirely possible to be a Catholic and not to be a Roman Catholic if you belong to one of these Eastern Catholic um, churches. But they're fully Catholic. They're as Catholic as we are. Um, and Mary is absolutely right that, first of all, the liturgies are, the liturgies are beautiful. And I really, re as a liturgist, I really, really wish that more Latin Rite Catholics n had some experience with Eastern Rite Catholic liturgies because all the crazy stuff that happened after Vatican II that was not not called for by Vatican II, but happened after Vatican II. That stuff didn't go on, and they, the, Eastern, the Eastern Catholic rites have maintained very reverent, very prayerful, very beautiful liturgies um, all through the, the crazy 70s and 80s. Okay. Did I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Mary. Did you want to no, say no, something? No, that, that, that's all I wanted to say is there are even people that have been Catholic all of their lives have never heard, and when we moved back to South Bend, there were quite a number of Catholics in our in our neighborhood, and they all came to say, well, which church are you going to? Are you, know, you going to go to Christ the King? Are you going to go to Little Flower? Are you going to go to St. Pius X? Because we were right in that area where we could have chosen any of those. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we're going to be going to St. Michael's Ukrainian Catholic Church. And they're looking at me like, oh! Yeah. <laughs> you're not a Catholic. You're not really Catholic, then, are you? You have a you have a, a, a statue of the Blessed Virgin in your yard, but you're not. Yeah. Really <laughs> so it was it was interesting to see that, and still there's one that just cannot wrap her head around it. Mm. You know, just as, it, and that is sad because they, people are missing out on a lot. There's Absolutely. some wonderful saints. Saint Absolutely. John Chrysostom. Yes, was. An Eastern Rite Catholic, yes. like St. Basil the Great, you know, doctors of the church. Mm -hmm. Eastern Indeed. Rite, you know. In fact, Catholic Answers publishes a very short little little booklet called 20 Answers Eastern Catholicism. If you are curious about what Eastern Catholics uh, do, or Mary and James, if you want to give these out to your friends who think you're not Catholic, um, <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can buy them for like a dollar, these, these, little, these little booklets called 20 Answers Eastern Catholicism. Okay. And they're very, they're very short, pithy answers, but they, they rebut people like that who say that Eastern Catholics aren't Catholics. They're absolutely Catholics. And as you said, Mary, we can all learn something from, from our Eastern, right, Eastern Catholic brothers and sisters. However, along those same lines, not every church that calls themselves Catholic is Catholic, is it? Because I was told by my parents there used to be a church on Sample Street called Polish National Catholic. That's true. Yeah. That's true. The Polish National Catholic Church uh, is, um, I guess they technically, don't quote me, but I think they'd be considered schismatic. Yeah. Okay? So they, um, they have valid sacraments and stuff because the people who started them were validly ordained priests, um, but they're not in union with the Pope, <coughs> and so therefore they 
they're schismatic. Okay. Um, yeah, so you have to you have to do your do your do your research. It's still there. But um, the 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 real clue, you guys, if you're just like man, if you're like man, now I don't know. Walk into any church, any walk into any actually Catholic church, and um, <laughs> and you'll see. You're almost guaranteed to see a picture of the Pope. Like walk into our vestibule here, you see the Pope and you see the Bishop. Yep. Okay. If you walk into an Eastern Rite Church, you're going to see the Pope, and then the Metropolitan or whatever the the you know figurehead of that diocese is. It's not going to be Bishop Rhodes, okay, because he's the Latin Rite Bishop. But look for that picture of the Pope and the local bishop, and that's how you'll know that you're in a, a church that is truly a Catholic church. And like I say, it's not guaranteed. They don't have those pictures. Don't have to be there. But chances are, you walk into a Catholic church, you're going to see those. You walk into a Protestant church, if you see the bishop and the pope, you'd better ask him if they're going to become Catholic. Yet. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I just had one other thing uh, that I wanted to add to was um, when my mother was dying, you, when they talk about the graces that you receive from the sacraments, hers was a very visible grace that she received. I found a Maronite Catholic priest from San Diego who came down to Tijuana to the clinic where my mother was being treated for her cancer. Mm -hmm. And it took quite a while. We went through the whole list of priests that she knew out in, in California and none could come. And this Maronite <coughs> priest finally came after 13 hours of phone calls. And he came and he anointed her, gave her communion. And after that, a light shone out of her body. And I thought, well, you haven't gotten very much sleep, so you're hallucinating, and I wasn't going to say a word, you know. But the priest saw it too. And he said, Did you see that? You know, he was so excited. And I said, Did you mean the, you know, because <laughs> they didn't want to scare my mother, you know. I, just, yeah. I said, Did you mean that? And he goes, Yes. He goes, Your mother has been healed. And I knew that she had been spiritually healed, mm -hmm. that she was still going to die. Mm -hmm. He thought she had been physically healed, too. She died four hours later. Wow. And she died a very, very peaceful death. Glory to God. Wow. So, and, you know, the people that I tell that story to, like, really saw it? Is it not just me? The priest saw it, and, and his driver saw it, too, you know, so... So sometimes we don't actually see what happens to people when they receive a sacrament, but just because we don't see it doesn't mean Amen. something hasn't yeah. happened, you know? Just like, I, I always point to Eucharistic miracles for the, same, for the same reason. We profess that the Eucharist, even though it's the, it has the appearance of bread, that when the Eucharist is confected, it's actually substantially the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Sometimes God gives us little hints of that when the host actually bleeds or it actually turns into distressed cardiac tissue, you know. And I always ask people who aren't Catholic, regardless of whether they're an atheist or a Protestant or whatever, I say, how do you account for that on your, on your view, mm -hmm. on your atheistic worldview, or your Protestant worldview? I say, how do you explain, look at these dozens of Eucharistic miracles where the host actually turns into bleeding human flesh. How do you how do you account for that, you know? And, and and people say, well, it's a hoax, you know. Okay, some of them probably are hoaxes. But if even one of them is true, then atheism is false. Protestantism is false. Okay, then Catholicism is true, you know. Now we don't have these miracles. We don't base our faith on on miracles alone. Okay, as we've seen, we just had an entire three week series on reasons to believe the Catholic faith. But um, the miracles do help. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what they're there for. Sandra. Um, <clears throat> before you became Catholic, did you ever hear in your faith the mercy that God was merciful? Because I have a cousin who was converted to Catholicism, Catholicism mm -hmm. and everybody in the family that wasn't Catholic, um, on one side of my family there are a lot of Protestants, mm -hmm. And she said she never heard the word mercy mm -hmm. from God the entire time she was Protestant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I was very fortunate that I, that I knew that God was merciful, and I knew that he was drawing me to his church precisely because of his mercy. But I'm, I'm sure that your, your family 
is not alone, um, that there are people like that who unfortunately don't know the great love that God has. I thought it was has. so sad. Yeah, you know? it is sad, absolutely. And everybody was giving her grief for becoming a Catholic. Mm. Um, and I wanted to say one time I looked up a map of the religions through the world, mm -hmm. and I was really surprised how what a minority Christianity is, mm -hmm. and um, the biggest religion practiced out there is Muslim. They're pretty close. Um, my my degree is in comparative religion, so I'm pretty I'm pretty tuned in on that. They're both pretty close. Um, they're about 1.2 <coughs> billion Catholics and 1. Point maybe 5 or 6 billion Christians. Um, and the Muslims are, you know, 1.6 or 7, you know, so they're, they're pretty close. But yeah, Islam is, uh, you know, it's not much of a thing here. I think about 2% of Americans are Muslim. But yeah, sometimes much of a thing we a lot. get to thinking that, you know, in our own small world that, you know, we're a lot of people that believe the same, but there aren't. And a lot of Christians are being persecuted. Indeed. And that's why we have the, the, the duty as Christians to evangelize, right? Mm -hmm. Not to shove our religion down other people's throats, mm -hmm. not to impose it upon them, but instead of imposing, to propose good reasons mm -hmm. for believing what we believe, right? Because as we said throughout this whole presentation, Jesus wants every human person to belong to his church, right? As Frank Sheet said, the Catholic Church was made by the God who made men, you know? And the Catholic Church has the balm for every wound, right? As, as Pope St. John Paul said, he said to young people, he said, it is Jesus who you dream of when you dream of happiness, right? The Catholic Church has the answers to all the questions that afflict modern life whether they're about religion, whether they're about human flourishing, whether they're about how to live a moral life. And that was the, the beauty for me coming into the church too, was as a Protestant, I thought that I was gonna have to wrestle with the Bible and figure out every single question on my own because what else was there, you know? And then I breathed a sigh of relief when I came to the church and I saw that there were 2,000 years of some of the best and brightest minds of human history and the church that Jesus had, you know, infallibly set up to teach on these things had already settled, what am I supposed to believe about this or that hot button social issue, you know? And so I could just relax into the, into the teaching of the church and know that Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to guide the church into the fullness of truth. And when the church teaches something on faith and morals, you know that it's true. You don't have to second guess. And as a Protestant, I was just second guessing everything all the time. And coming into the church is just like, okay, you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you.